I am a gigantic Sonic fan. I played every mainline console entry, a vast majority of spin-offs and handhelds, seen too many episodes of the TV shows, discussed the series extensively with a few close friends, and will buy SA2 for a Steam friend pretty much immediately if I see they don't have it. If you ask anyone who knows me just a little bit, they'll tell you I roll around to the thought of Sonic. Despite that passion, I haven't produced any in-depth thoughts videos at a single Sonic game here. Even when Frontier started its press cycle, I didn't think I'd make a video about it, because I thought I would do every other game first. But September 6th changed my mind with 1OK Rock's trailer. That trailer started my hype for Sonic Frontiers, a hype I haven't felt for this franchise since generations when I was 13. Not that I hate everything afterwards, I'm probably one of the more positive Sonic fans in my age group. There's just been a sense of, oh, that one'll be okay ever since Generations came out. Even Mania, which I adore, S-rank type of adore, didn't pump me up since I knew it would just repeat what worked in the classics. Frontiers looks like something different, something I never asked for. An ambitious entry in the series going completely against the ethos I believe worked for Sonic's gameplay. So that brings a question, did I like it? Well, I don't know yet. I want to start with something different today. Everything in the prologue portion of this video is being written, voiced, and if my schedule allows it, edited before Sonic Frontiers comes out. I want to give y'all a speedy grasp where I come from with this series and a raw opinion for what I thought I wanted to see from Sonic and Frontiers on its own. First of all, Sonic is one of the earliest games I remember playing. Going back to when I was little, and I mean real tiny, my dad used to take me and my brother to a comic store he'd play Magic the Gathering at every week. We'd usually read some of the comics they could trust with four-year-olds and play whatever games they'd hook up to the TV. And one of the earliest I remember was Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And it was fucking rad to see that blue hedgehog pop out of the title screen, fly through the water, and see some red fucker take whatever those rocks were from us. Obviously, we were four and didn't know everything that was going on, but we could tell that the gems made Sonic go super, the red dude took them, and we figured out how the co-op flying worked. More likely than not, one of my dad's friends told us that one, though. We were pretty fucking stupid. I don't recall us ever passing Marble Garden Zone because of that stupidity, and two, because we'd have to leave. And then at some point later, we'd get a GameCube with SA2, and once it came out, Sonic Mega Collection. We played the absolute shit out of those, and I'd continue following Sonic for as long as I've lived. I know many fall out of love with Sonic, take a break from it, or only like games from a certain era, but that didn't really happen with me. I found myself coming back to it year after year. However, that's not to say I liked every Sonic game. It's a long series with deferring directions. So inevitably, there's some I replay every year, and others I just dreaded getting footage for today. To make it simple so you can know if my opinions on Frontiers might line up with yours, I'm gonna do something wild. Absolutely the dumbest thing someone could ever do in a Sonic video. Right now, I am putting up a binary graph of which mainline and debatably mainline Sonic games I currently enjoy and which I don't enjoy. I'm ignoring all nuance of where they rank and why until I focus on that specific title in like, I don't know, five years or something. To make it clear, I'm not putting this here to shit on certain Sonic games. It's purely to set up what I look for in Sonic. And usually, I want a fast-paced arcade-like structure with a semi-serious plotline. I'll begin by defining what I mean by the latter first, since stories in Sonic has been a hot topic for the past few years. I feel that tonally, thematically, and in execution, Sonic stories peaked in SA1 and SA2. Which, yeah, I know, this isn't some fucking spicy take calling Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 the best stories in the series. I I think 75% of Sonic fans are going to answer one of those two. But that's because it's true. Adventure's use of multiple perspectives to tell their stories, a growing cohesive universe in every region, acknowledgement of the continuity we've seen in the classic titles, advanced cinematography for platforms at the time, dire stakes, perfect soundtracks, and characters exuding a perfect blend of Western and Eastern tropes made them so good. Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 had all of this for me, and anything after either fumbled at some point or didn't aim for that direction. Heroes wanted a lighter tone, secret rings through Lost World cold the cast drastically, 
simply because fans were complaining about too many friends. Colors Onward extinguished most of Sonic's flair, while 06 and Forces both clearly had something good beneath the surface that got muddied during development for different reasons. I'm simplifying my problems with them here for the sake of time, but I think y'all get the gist. I've wanted a righteous tale that expands the lore of Sonic and his cast naturally. A setting aimed at the edgy kids and preteens that Sonic is meant for. Expand on previous plots like SA1 did for Sonic 3, and I expect I'm gonna point towards SA1 a lot today, because Sonic Frontiers seems like a reaction to adventure. Here's the thing, for me, every entry after Sonic Adventure 2 have been a reaction to SA2 in some form. For the story, that meant following up on its plot lines up until Secret Rings. We'd continue to see Gun, Shadow, The Ark, Gerald's Journal, Chaos Control, consolidation of character relationships like Team Sonic and the first iteration of Team Dark, even questions like how Eggman knew of Chaos from SA1 were recontextualized within SA2. SA2's story is more complete with SA1's plot lines and as such the following entries, but SA2 onwards didn't follow a thread Sonic 1 through Adventure 1 slowly introduced which in my opinion is the Chaos Emerald's history. Sonic 1 introduced their power and nature to eventually spread like Dragon Balls, Sonic 2 increased them to 7 and created super forms, Sonic 3 finalized their size, introduced the Master Emerald and laid the groundwork for their history, while Adventure ended their cohesive backstory development thus far with Chaos to Call and the Echidna flashbacks, a story of the Chaos Emerald's past. Then SA2 pushed their role forward with Chaos Control, one of the rawest techniques ever. And as cool as it is, it did further the emeralds as a do-whatever plot device. Which I'm cool with. Their power, power is chaos energy, an immeasurable resource that by definition, man can never fully understand. It's why their power has always had a mystic aspect to them with shrines and murals. Even those that dare to understand them from a scientific standpoint like Gerald end up creating monsters like the Bio Lizard. Adventure told how primitive civilizations feared the emeralds they couldn't understand, and SA2 cautioned that even the smartest minds in the world can never fully control them. However, it's after SA1 and 2 when they stop contextualizing how society interacted with the emeralds. Yes, Unleashed and Riders have the Gaia Temples and Babylon's Carpet Emporium, but does this really add to the emerald story? They haven't grown the emeralds, just kept them at the same level of mystery as before. I'm not against other civilizations using them, it's just that my issues get compounded even further with Lost World colors and forces where they might as well not be there at all. Getting to Frontiers, from the info we currently have, it seems like it might do more than that. I get the idea that Frontiers is going to recontextualize the Emerald's role in the pre-SA2 games. Their appearance on three different islands in the classics, a new appearance on Starfall Islands, it just lines up to me and Origins made me see it more. I initially thought just the classics, but that god-tier Knuckles prologue animation makes me think they're not ignoring SA1. The point is that the more I've seen of Frontiers, the more it seems like the storyline is aimed for what I have wanted for years. I can't say the same about gameplay. SA2 is my favorite in the series. It shifted the direction SA1 started that all later games followed. An arcade-like scoring, multiple missions, rail grinding, stage-to-stage -stage progress, and increased speed. Those are the aspects I love in Sonic. An arcade push to improve myself with last-minute do-or-die level layouts at a fast pace. And keep in mind when I say that, I'm a huge RPG guy. I can't get enough of my long stories and explorable worlds. I just don't think Sonic has ever done non-linear, open, or hub world structures that well. Sometimes in objective-based format like treasure hunting, missions and generations, or like one-third of Team Chaotix missions have worked. But every other mandatory mechanic like the medals in Unleashed or the missions in 06 have left a sour taste in my mouth. Though in the latter's case, I think the load times take 75% of the blame. In fact, when we first heard about the open zone system, I was kind of worried. Hub worlds and Sonic have only ever hit right with me once, and that was in Sonic Adventure. Wrapping an entire Sonic game around an open world is the last thing I've ever wanted in the series, yet it looks fun here. There's also a skill tree, something I despised in Secret Rings and Unleashed, yet it looks fun. We get a new combat system, something I thought Sonic should stop trying after the ear-bleeding trumpets of the Werehog, yet it looks fun. Everything I normally hate in Sonic looks fun in Frontiers. If Frontiers is good, it could be evidence that listening to Sonic fans at the degree Sonic Team did for over a decade can be a detriment. Never in a million years would I have made Sonic Frontiers. Sonic fans don't know what they want, and it's seeming I might be as Sonic fan as can possible.
Next, I want to go through an abridged version of Frontier's pre-release hype so you'll understand why I'm feeling more positive right now. First, we gotta talk about 2017 when Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces came out. Our initial build-up for both was actually pretty up there. Sonic Mania was and is the true Sonic 4 classic fans always wanted, while Forces looked like a return to a grittier story with gameplay like Generations. We were all a little confused at Classic Sonic coming back since they revealed Mania at the time, but we're getting something like Sonic Generations 2, so I can't screw up that bad, right? Well, both games are for another day, basically Mania came out to critical acclaim, while Forces was the most middle of the road, not that good, not an atrocious Sonic game for me. And I think that hardcore middling feeling Forces received hit Sonic Team because they changed their act for Frontiers. Sonic Team told Sega they weren't releasing a new Sonic entry until they felt ready, gave Frontiers a 5 year development cycle, and conducted regular focus testing over that time. Focus testing that leaked online since early 2021. I brushed off most of it since, obviously, Sonic would never go to an open world gameplay style. Little did I know that some of them were real. Others were fake as fuck though. Like, Jesus Christ, a playable silver? No way they were doing that after Forces. These leaks got really bad after the first CG trailer, which made it easy for anyone to spout any bullshit they wanted. It was legitimately just Sonic running through a forest and the words, zap? Maybe that's one of the big mysteries of Frontiers. That trailer said so much nothing about Frontiers that even Azuka admitted they announced it too early. I mean, it took around a year afterwards until we'd see any real gameplay of Frontiers from an IGN showcase, and it looked bad. I mean, throw Sonic into Unreal Engine and get comments saying, Sega, hire this man, kinda bad. I had no hope for Frontiers from the first CG or the initial footage we saw. During that entire year between, my buddy Joe would send me stuff about it all the time, and I just could not care at the time. And that's when it shifted. Sonic Team swore that Frontiers was good, told us we just don't get it, took it to conventions for people to play a demo, and everyone said it was good. Like, won an award good. I saw gameplay of what I thought shouldn't work, and I wanted to try it. How the fuck did this happen? Well, going back to IGN, the footage they show was from a very early build. Additionally, they showed off little of what Frontiers had to offer. Just a few enemies, basic combat, and jogging in the open world. They didn't show a fraction of what Frontiers had to offer. In September 6th, that's when it happened. Sonic came back for me. One OK Rocks vandalized with the CG trailer was it for me. Every reveal afterwards gave me the same feeling as when I was a kid watching Sonic Heroes reveals. Frontiers looks like it could be the third best 3D Sonic game. Maybe the best one, and I'm ready to talk about it. Oh wait, no, there's some prologue type beats. I can still edit a part about these before the game releases, that'll make my unpaid project manager happy. Sega released three projects in the build-up to Frontiers, and I can't tell if you need to engage in them before release, but they're fun and don't take up much time. First was Tails Tube, a short series about the world of Sonic in a VTuber format starring Tails. My guess is that since Corone has single-handedly saved the Sonic brand, Sega released these to thank her. Admittedly, it is kinda cheesy with Saturday morning type jokes, but I still think it's kinda cute. The way Tails acts reminds me of when I was a kid trying to make my first few cringy videos. Each episode has another character as a guest, with Sonic in episode 1, Orbot and Eggman in episode 2, and finally Knuckles in the third one. Something I noticed in all three, and I know I'm setting myself up for disappointment, is that they hate towards the power of chaos. Sonic and Tails bring up how the Emeralds go to new islands and mention how they've ignored the truth of the Emeralds. Eggman talks about Gerald a little bit, and Knuckles diverts Tails' questions about the Master Emerald since his mission is only to protect it, not know its secrets. Episode 3 then ends with Tails and Sonic noticing that the Emeralds have appeared on Starfall Island, where Frontiers takes place, prompting them to meet up with Amy and head over there. If Frontiers actually is going for an Emerald-based story, then I can't believe I'm saying this, Tails Tube is genius! It talks about the past islands and current knowledge of the Chaos Emerald so seamlessly that I didn't even realize it was trying to set up Frontiers until just now. And then the next two prologue pieces jump right after Tails Tube. First we got an 8 page webcomic named Convergence starring Tails, Amy, and Sonic written by Sonic comic writer Ian Flynn, who is also writing Frontiers this time, thank fucking god. Convergence is alright, Sonic, Tails, and Amy converge to fight a fake Eggman robot that spouts line Dean Bristow would have said, and then a second part has Eggman converge on the island trying to understand Starfall's technology. If anything, a bridge between Tails, Tube, and Frontiers to get these four characters to the island. And our third part, Divergence, is one of the greatest non-game projects 
Sonic has ever had. It's an animation following Knuckles by the same team that worked on other Sonic animations like Chow in Space, Rise of the Wisps, and Team Sonic Racing. This short is actually the first time we get to dive into the perspective of Knuckles in years. We see him thinking about his role with flashbacks to Chaos, to Call, his tribe, appearances of Chow on Sky Sanctuary, and even a nice look of Angel Island as it did in SA1. Again, this short is just to get Knuckles to Starfall Island, but there's some heavy story implications this time. The way he gets there is by finding this gear on the ground and putting it into something on Angel Island. It then teleports him to Starfall Island, where he has one of his most badass moments in years. Knuckles fucks the shit out of the enemies will fight, and gets captured by the main villain Sage and one of the Titans. It comes to a close with him getting captured and having another introspection about how he's been working by himself all this time. Knuckles diverged from Angel Island and may yet again diverge from his trust in his solitary lifestyle. This animation, as well as the Sonic 2 movie, have done more for Knuckles than anything since SA2. And the connection between Starfall and Angel Island brings up more questions about the islands in Sonic 1 and Sonic 2. Look, all this to say, I'm railing that hopium copium powder for Sonic Frontiers. Go. Holy fuck was that copium good. Game's out, I have played it, and it was sick. I'm not gonna go and say this was the greatest game of all time, not even my personal game of the year, since I played AI1 during the summer. Fuck yeah! But this was hot. <clears throat> Having finished Frontiers, I can safely say I had an enjoyable and engaging experience without some kind of giant butt to it. Minor gripes that become more prevalent when put to paper, since that's how making videos kinda works, but still, enjoyment all around. I'd go so far as to put Frontiers in my top games with SA2, Mania, and Generations. It's rough around the edges and has a lot of jank as we'll see as I go down the line, but it's reinvigorated my interest in Sonic, which I can't say for any other entry in the past few years. It hasn't felt this good to be a Sonic fan in years. Seeing the positive reception is astounding. All my friends, even those that are apathetic towards Sonic, are discussing it with me in a positive manner. I'm hyped to see how the Frontiers follow-up improves on what we got. Moving on, I understand by the time this is up, Frontiers will have been out for nearly a month. Even at the time of writing, I've seen the negative, positive, and neutral opinions about Frontiers. As y'all can tell by now, I'm in the overwhelmingly positive category. However, Frontiers is not for everyone. Frontiers makes some bold decisions that just aren't gonna fit everyone. But please, don't be hostile towards those that disliked it. I've seen both the negative and positive sides of the argument getting toxic, and I think we should remember that this is just a video game. Until people praise a Sonic game where Tails looks in the camera and condones war crimes, it's not a big deal if people liked it or not. Additionally, please don't insult other people's videos in my comments. I've only noticed it twice in the past, but I feel it reflects poorly on me when it happens, so I'd prefer if y'all don't. Anyway, what I think is most important important with Frontiers is to look at it from the lens that we have a new formula. This isn't Adventure 3, Open World Generations, or even Sonic Broken <coughs> GPS World. Frontiers is Frontiers, a new era for Sonic. It looks towards the past of the series to open up for the new coming next. Anyway, like all of my videos, this will have spoilers. Unlike before, and maybe from now on for any game less than a year old, I'll mark the spoiler section in the chapters and put some text on screen when those parts begin. However, I will use non-cutscene footage of all five islands throughout the whole video. Which brings me to the one small spoiler I'm gonna mention right now for the sake of easier discussion, and a warning because of marketing snafus. So starting that now, Frontier's marketing implied we'd have five islands to explore. That's inaccurate. Kronos, Ares, and Chaos Island account for three fully original islands, followed by Rhea and Uranus Islands that reuse the aesthetics from Kronos. Due to information we have now, it's clear that at some point they broke up the mass of Kronos into the three islands for time constraints, because Rhea is just cutscenes and platform challenges, the three share file names, you have an invisible barrier blocking entry between Rhea and Kronos in the final release, there's two lines in the game mentioning only at three islands, and you can even connect all three with hacking methods. Some people theorize that you were meant to end the game at Chaos Island, but as of now, that is completely unfounded. In-game code implies that early on, and I mean before concept art early, there would have been an original fourth island. I'm theorizing they cut off the Arena section early when they realized they lacked the 
time for an original fourth island, which is why Arenos' entire design is intact. Rhea seems a bit different. It still has unique architecture with little to do and unused puzzles can be hacked back in, implying that it was meant to be a part of one of the other two islands until fairly late. So basically my theory is that the idea to play all of Kronos in one go was cut very early on, and making the Rhea section majority cutscenes was to minimize any rewrites required because of that change. We can also assume that plot-wise the entire three are considered Greater Kronos, and the names for Rhea and Kronos are kind of like how Haiti and the Dominican Republic share Hispaniola Island. Island. And while I theorize the reasons for this, it's still a baffling decision in marketing. They should not have ever made it seem like there were five islands. Only this menu in-game even makes it seem as though there's five islands, and that's something they could have added in late. It almost feels like they wanted to make you think there were only three islands, and then the one and a quarter island could be a surprise. A big reveal when you think you're on the ending. I want to get this out of the way now because I feel the discussion of how many islands do we actually have undercuts what islands four and five are. Island four serves its purpose purpose to kick off the final act with interesting platforming thrown in, while Island 5 still has a comparable size to Island 1, helping Island 1 to work better as an introduction because of its smaller size and more compact nature, and Island 5 doesn't drag on too long when we're in the final stretch. Though despite my defense, Rhea is still disappointing. It shows that even when Sonic Team fought their hardest for more time and manpower, they still had to rush a game out the door. And while I'm disappointed, I am a little more forgiving on this since Frontiers already had a long runtime by Sonic standards. Frontiers is the longest Sonic adventure without padding like Heroes or Unleashed. I clocked in at around 20 hours after nabbing the Platinum Trophy, observing every optional cutscene, and achieving every cyberspace challenge. None of that felt like a hassle to me. Pure enjoyment the whole time. I'm still even going back to scour the island for remaining collectibles and time attacking my favorite cyberspace stages. Frontiers is as long as it requires. I'll add that you can skip anything you want, and I played leisurely for the first two islands, so if you see some someone else say, I beat it in 12 hours, don't be shocked. Frontiers kickstarts immediately after the prologue. Knuckles is already captured, Sonic, Tails, and Amy continue flying towards the island, and Eggman is messing with Starfall Island's technology. There, he places a new defense slash hacking system into Starfall's tower, which in an attempt to save him from the island's army, sucks him into what's known as cyberspace. Sonic, Tails, and Amy then also get sucked in during the flight, separating the heroes. Sonic himself landing in a Green Hill-looking area. A wild situation he can't get out of because the PS4 is still installing the fucking game. Sonic then uses his speed to escape cyberspace and is told by a disembodied voice that he's the key. A vague-ass term so you can discover everything on your own. Sonic Frontiers is a mysterious open-world collectathon type of game which nicely weaves every collectible into Starfall's world, which I guess is the right time to talk about Starfall. Starfall consists of cyberspace stages in the style of traditional level-to-level -level Sonic gameplay and canonically three separate islands, with Island 1 having the three differently named maps to it. Unlike past Sonic games, Frontiers aims to push a mystery with Starfall and how it relates to the Chaos Emeralds. If I had to trace our points to figure out the mystery, we've got the island's advanced architecture that interacts with the Chaos Emeralds, fleshy robotic guards defending the island, a new race of little rock people known as the Cocos, larger enemies known as Titans that take the role of bosses, the cyberspace realm that's trapped Sonic's friends and Dr. Eggman, and Sage, the greatest character Sonic's team made since Shadow. Each one of these serves a purpose to the mystery of Starfall's past, the narrative of Sonic's present, as well as presenting a new aspect of Frontier's gameplay. So I'm gonna ignore all of that and talk about the gameplay to easily separate the spoiler section. As you all know by now, Sonic Frontiers has two different parts. The open zone segments that take up a majority of it, and the cyberspace stages that I'd call maybe an eighth of the experience. I'll start with the open zone since cyberspace was designed as a complement towards open zone, and as such will be easier to talk about second. Upon leaving cyberspace, you'll immediately find Sonic controls different from past adventures. Initial talk of it was generations without a set track. And that certainly is a tagline to get someone interested, yet not one to prepare your expectations. Boost Formula Games treated Sonic between a platformer and a race car. It kept Sonic on a track that the developers could easily guide, in theory minimizing chances for jank. Sonic Frontier's open zones are filled with jank. But in my opinion, a fun jank. Jank that's led to interesting speedrun tactics based around Sonic's boost, air boost, and the trajectory in where they're used. Even at his jankiest, 
I had fun controlling Sonic. Like, I almost get the feeling that Sonic Team knew about some of it and just left it in because it was more fun this way. Frontier slows Sonic down compared to boost games to grant you more control. And even if he feels a bit off to you, you're able to slightly alter Sonic's speed, acceleration, turning, and so on in the option menu. I turned every dial up to maximum since I was told that's recommended for longtime Sonic fans, and I'd recommend the same. At my settings, I'd call Sonic's controls some of the most natural since SA1. Anything I wanted to do with Sonic could be done, and the majority of where I wanted to go could be reached. Made even more natural since this is the first time when a Sonic game actually uses most of the buttons on the controller. Sonic has tended to maintain what I was gonna call <coughs> Nakaism or some fuck, <laughs> but oh my god, he got arrested yesterday, so he lost, like, the non-existent respect I still had to him. Let's just call it single button bullshit. The only shared button outside of combat is the homing attack sharing the basic punch button, which doesn't get in the way since the homing lock-on is one of the most lenient in the series. Boost on the trigger also feels more natural to me. It's more in tune with racing game controls, which is kind of funny because boost no longer works like a nitro as it did in the boost engine. Entries. I was confused by it for a while because all the pre-release footage online had testers tapping the button and it felt a little faster, so I did that for most of my playthrough, but you don't actually need to do that. Holding boost or tapping it seems about the same speed, although the tap method is good for keeping your boost gauge up, because instead of getting rings, funny aliens, or killing enemies to build your boost gauge, it just refills over time. Pretty much exactly like stink stamina meter in Breath of the Wild, and yeah, I know there's a fuck ton of Zelda-inspired shit here, I just know very little of Breath of the wild, and I think it's funnier to keep it that way. The previous boost to win idea has also been completely stripped from Frontiers. It no longer hurts enemies, air boosting is just a dash, and in general, it doesn't go as fast as rush through forces. As a means of traversing the open zones with control, I think the trade-off is worth it. Other returning aspects include parkour from Lost World, SI2's bounce, Mania's drop dash implemented into 3D, the light speed dash, and sidestepping. Additionally, Sonic has a new move called the side loop, where he draws a circle to stun enemies, interact with puzzles, and spawn rings for a quick recharge. Likely a callback to Sonic Team's most competent game, Nights into Dreams. <laughs> yeah, flame me for that comment. All these movement options paired with how they interact with each other and the environment is what makes Frontiers for me. Starting with Sonic's momentum, since that's some shit people bitched about pre-release who have no fucking idea what they're talking about. Sorry, whatever, okay. Again, Sonic was comparable to a car in the boost games. Accelerate to go, slam the brakes by pulling back and performing a stomp, or just stop flooring the accelerator to slowly fizzle like when my controller kept fucking disconnecting on the jank-ass PC ports. In Frontiers, you have almost as much control of him as you did in Adventure. 1. Complete full turn radius and can stop as soon as you're ready to. What halts it more is that in Frontiers, most actions lead to a loss of momentum. Jumping itself even has a low maximum horizontal velocity. All boost at max speed, yet still have a jump speed similar to his top jog. However, due to Sonic's boost and homing attack tricks, I never really felt that it hindered me. If I saw an island, I could almost always make it there in some way, be that a higher plane, a secret revealed by a puzzle, or the use of a well-timed rail jump. Sometimes you go fucking flying in Frontiers, and it's tons of fun. Frontiers doesn't let you boost where you want very easily. You need to work for it. Whether you like this or not is fully up to your own personal taste, but within the confines of Frontiers open world, I feel that it does its job. You even need to relearn the homing attack a little bit since it really kills momentum. Sonic's got a long breather period after each attack, like Sonic 06. It never became an issue or even required any time to get used to in the open zones, since you're mainly using it for combat, and platforming with loose or non-existent time limits. Homing attack in cyberspace is a more fun story, so I'm gonna hold on to that till we get there. Let's get to the islands themselves. While each island has a fair number of collectibles, there's two that are your end goal. Keys to receive chaos emeralds, and character-based memory tokens to save your friends and trigger cutscenes. Get hearts for Amy on Kronos, medals for Knuckles on Ares, wrenches for Tails at Chaos, and Sage will be at all four islands. Said four have an infinite amount of keys and tokens, so how you go about earning them is completely up to you. If you play the full experience as intended, you'll have explorative platform challenges, minor puzzles, fast-paced beginner-friendly combat, and the cyberspace stages to engage with. Those platform challenges and puzzles will likely take up a majority of your time. One of my initial worries from pre-release content was that the islands would be extremely empty. Again, the first few previews looked god-awful, and I'm glad to see that besides the first 45 or so minutes, the islands are filled with things to interact with. Every few meters, you've got some new rail, enemy, puzzle, or platform to climb up on. For Kronos and about half the way through Ares, I leisurely interacted with whatever came my way or went to the plot progression marker. Then I decided to prioritize puzzles because having the full map early on and the fast travel at Grants is pretty handy. I could tell from the beginning this would be more time efficient, 
I just didn't really want to play that way at first. I allowed the vibes to take me where Sonic desired, <laughs> which resulted in some serious ADHD I'll get to. Now the puzzles themselves are weird to look at. Now on one hand, they never broke up the speed, which is great. Anytime I enter a puzzle, it only lasts a few seconds, and even the longer ones typically involve Sonic's speed. At no point did the puzzles break up Sonic's natural flow. I felt engaged with most of them, but I wouldn't call them difficult one way or the other. Getting to the types of puzzles, I'd classify them into three categories. Speed puzzles, Siloop puzzles, and environmental puzzles. Speed puzzles including ones where you run to touch a button before a generous timer runs out, or others involving Sonic running, diving, or jumping through the square hole. They fit the best with Sonic as a character since they have him scale towers, grind, boost, and just anything that makes a piece of the open zone feel like a mini act. Well, Siloop puzzles mainly just involve Sonic looping a fire to put it out, reveal switches, or turn off greenhouse gases. Nothing all that complicated. Like, if you see a puzzle marker and you're unsure what to do, just Siloop some shit and see what happens. There's this music one in the final island that I was confused about, and I just Siloop shit and figured it out without requiring the sounds. Now, the environmental ones have some of my favorites. Not because of difficulty or how they engage with you, but because Starfall Island's ancient technology has created some of the funniest yeah. shit for Sonic. Hamster wheels, simple floor puzzles, actions that are just funny to see Sonic perform. Although the first one they showed in most trailers sucks dick. It's just Sonic moving one statue counterclockwise, and not a single other is like it, or this other connect the dots to reveal grind rails puzzle. Honestly, I have no issue with the puzzles we have, I just think they should have gone a little further. For example, have the square holes go across a large portion of the map, hand the camera a full 360 during soccer, add a rhythm mechanic to the hamster wheel, or maybe actually use this grinding rail thing. There's at least two more they cut from Raya Island, so maybe they were just hard to put back somewhere else. I can see a few of these ideas getting added in some challenge mode DLC, but in their current form, I still had enough fun with them. Their nice flow into the island exploration made me excited to try out the puzzles, while many other games make me worried if I see a puzzle in the distance. In fact, exploring and finding anything in the island is just fun. No matter what you do, you'll usually get an item to put dopamine in the brain. Mostly it's one memory token per challenge, a set of tokens hidden away, or you'll be rewarded for greater exploration with a cyberspace level, chaos emerald shine, cutscene, a new puzzle, and anything else I may be forgetting. Not all the time, because in a big game it just can't be perfect, but it tries its best so that a short series of platforms and rails give you a memory token, while the giant as Diamond hovering the sky has a Chaos Emerald Shrine. One that I couldn't fucking afford yet! Due to Starfall's technology, platforms just hang around in the middle of existence with their reward right at the end, often with a spring or dash ring to ensure you grab it. It's a freeform placement with a different style depending on the island. Starting, Kronos is far more compact than the later islands. It's got about as much knack of nicks and dopamine shards the other islands give, just spread across a smaller plot of land. It's probably in part caused by splitting the island, but I think this inadvertently works better better for a starting area. I gained a glimpse into what Frontiers has to offer within a short amount of time, and due to my leisure romp through Kronos, got distracted a lot. I'm glad I don't stream, because I'm watching my footage and I'll stand right fucking next to an easy puzzle, only to get distracted by a spring 20 meters away. Holy shit, a chat would be in the right to yell at me for this fuck. Thankfully, that compact nature helped with making sure I never lacked what I needed when I needed it. I had memory tokens whenever I met with Amy, and I was always prepared for a Chaos Emerald, setting myself up for Ares and Chaos Island when it opens up significantly. In fact, way too much for my ADHD go-with-the-flow style that worked in Kronos. I mean, wow guys, I had to actually use the map. Who would have expected that in a fucking non-linear game? Ares and Chaos is also where engagement takes a peak gameplay-wise. Their wider, mountainous nature requires more careful platforming, forcing you to learn their environment. Ares having more freedom than Chaos due to an over-reliance on 2D sections in the latter. I know 2D in Modern Sonic is another hot-button topic, and I'll just say it's done fine in some places, unavoidable in others. And I mean that literally. Once you hit an interactive piece like a spring or dash panel, Sonic is locked into whatever two-dimensional space he's in until you go out the exit. It causes some mild annoyance. However, the jank ways of starting a 2D segment and the freeform platform placement actually made sequence breaking ludicrously fun. Seeing how many platforms I can skip is sometimes more fun than the platforming itself. I'll notice a memory token near the end of a platforming area, and instead of going through it all the way, I'll find a higher elevation so I can dash jump or rail jump into it. Maybe I'll enter a 2D segment at midway to stay in 3D to see how far I can go before the switch. 
Switch. I get janky ass backwards long jump vibes from this shit, and I feel pretty damn snarky when I succeed. Freedom felt uncapped as long as I could properly make use of Sonic's boost and drop dash. The only spot that felt egregious to me was this bridge on Chaos Island. It's totally climbable, less steep than past inclines, and sticks out like a boner in gym class. But an invisible wall here halts you until the plot allows you through. I got pretty annoyed when I hit it, but it was fucking hilarious when my friends did the same and I could laugh at them. And then, Rhea Island. While I'm still disappointed about what it could have been, it presents the most difficult sections for platforming. It's formatted where you run to multiple towers on the island and then find your way up. Some parts requiring boost from one rail to another at just the right speed to not overshoot. There's a new gimmick enemy that made some Vore fans happy, and even the parkour segments made you focus on tighter timing than previously. I'm honestly not even mad when I screw up, because Sonic falling such a long damn distance is fun, and it feels satisfying if you catch yourself midway. One of my other worries with Frontiers was the combat. No Sonic game in the past has ever proven to me that combat can coexist with Sonic's fast-paced, arcadey, reaction-based mechanics. Frontiers doesn't quell my worry, but that's because it only exists in the open zones. Frontiers is the first mainline game to attempt a real Sonic the Hedgehog combat. No power formation, sword, or werehog. Just Sonic himself, and I feel that led to the most coherent combat we've seen. Starting off, Sonic needs to unlock everything. We've got a skill tree and a stat system affecting Sonic's max maximum speed, ring count, attack, and defense. Raising those stats by finding the new mascots known as Cocos to an Elder Coco for speed and ring count, while the Hermit Coco will raise power and defense if you grant him their respective tokens. Annoyingly, Hermit Coco instantly raises everything, while Elder Coco will only raise your stats one level at a time. Which is kinda excruciating when everything maxes out at 99, and there's not too much reason in maxing out ring and speed. If your ring count maxes out, Sonic earns the ability to boost at top speed, so it's 100% avoidable. Except I wanted the Platinum Trophy, so by 20 minutes of my life. I wouldn't stress about grinding any of these stats to beat the game. Rink out and speed were somewhere in their 10s at the final island, while offense and defense were in the 30s. And as someone with experience in character action games and Sonic, I felt like the difficulty was about where it needed to be. Now the skill tree works like a traditional leveling system. It's a small tree that I completed early on in Chaos Island, and I think that fits for Sonic. Instead of an elaborate system where you have totally different sets every playthrough, you unlock the next move about when you've gotten comfortable with the last one, which I'd say fits for Sonic's fast simplistic nature. I don't come to Sonic games to think about my loadout. My backlog is filled with games where I can do just that. Now the combat itself is more in the flair side than substance. It's aiming towards a simplistic version of a character action game like Bayonetta or Metal Gear Rising. And so the main idea follows those games. Stagger an enemy to begin a combo, bring combo meter up for more options, and use your parry when being attacked. And Sonic's parry is one of the most generous guards I've ever seen. It grants you a witch time effect with some enemies and almost always gives you a chance for Sonic's mega powerful attack once unlocked, while not requiring any form of timing. As long as you hold down both bumpers, Sonic is in a state of parry preparedness, mitigating most difficulty from using the technique. You still need to make sure you're not getting hit while you attack, and just holding it can be boring, but it almost feels as though this shouldn't be the case. For example, these wolf enemies circle around Sonic and you can only stop through parrying, and a few puzzles in the island require parrying balls thrown at you. Ideas based around timing that just involve Sonic standing there. My assumption, and this one's just a theory, is that at one point the parry was too strict and they got rid of any timing after focus testers had too many issues. That's total speculation though, so at least eight of you are going to internalize it, forget where where you heard it from and then spread it around like fact. It doesn't bother me too much since parrying isn't nearly as large a focus in Frontiers as Bayonetta. Instead, your main means of staggering enemies usually comes from psi looping them. It has a satisfying feeling when you loop three enemies at once and more dynamic once you unlock an attack that lets you add a psi loop to your combos. My favorite example being the spider where you have to circle all four of his legs so that you can hit his weak point in the center. It reminds me of Tails' final boss in SA1 and I always like remembering SA1. Moves themselves look pretty fucking sick. One has Sonic zigzagging about, a swirly move that can send some enemies skyborne, and this fucking key blast move is straight out of DBZ. <laughs> All cool stuff that makes me feel like Goku. And while I haven't pulled it off quite yet, others have found wild cancel-based combos since the game released. I mean, unless you're playing at a purposefully low level, you won't need most of these. A majority of moves feel like it does the damage of what would normally be a combo finisher in KH2. Yeah, they look badass, I just don't feel like I've quite worked up to that attack. 
I'm also unsure if allowing these DB Fighter Z level combos was entirely on purpose. But if not, I still think it's fun jank instead of bad jank. It even makes me want to try staying at level 1 for my next run. Replayability is one of my big worries with Frontiers that I'll get to, and I think a low level run will be a good challenge. Now an added layer of its Sonic feeling energy is added once we get to the mid bosses. In addition to regular robots protecting Starfall, we have dedicated mini bosses known as the Guardians that require more strategy to them. For example, Asuda, the one we'd see in promo material, has you initially scale up his body with boost rings and then homing attack his weak points, making speed the primary incentive. Same goes for Squid, where you run along a path and sidestep his attacks before the real fight. Which I'd like more if it weren't half the bosses during the boost era, which is why I'm glad that Fortress expands on that. Grind on rails and stick to the rails with boost trails to catch up faster. It makes Guardians feel like individual acts in their own right. And in my opinion, combat peaked in Aerie since it's where originality shined. All four of the Guardians have this new act type of feeling. Shark has a full quick time event minigame, Sumo locks you into a wrestling ring where you need to slam him, Tank causes a tornado to turn, sweeping Sonic off the ground, thus requiring a rhythmic homing attack to end it, and Strider forces you to create circles on his grind rails to reach him. All separate and unique fights that feel like Sonic. Original Guardians still appear afterwards, but Chaos and Arenos kinda show where they needed to cut corners, because they recolor harder versions of the Ninja and Tower from Kronos. Which sucks because I would call these two the least engaging bosses in Frontiers. Ninjas and their recolors are beefed up normal enemies, while the towers only need a few Psy loops and a stomp attack to defeat them. Find enough bosses for the first island is not something I would bring back unless the deadline was coming close. Overall, I'd argue this is the closest Sonic has come to proper character action. Now hold on, I know y'all might be thinking I'm crazy here, but let me explain. Yes, Werehog is more mechanically complex. If I am going to compare the combat of both games to Devil May Cry and God of War, Werehog is far closer. However, I feel like the action of Frontiers feels the closest to the character of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, some of it might be a little closer to Goku, but they've been ripping off Goku since Sonic 2. I'm not debating the appeal of Werehog, I will be straight up today and say I'm not a big fan of it. But when you get down to it, that is Sonic the Werehog, not Sonic the Hedgehog. This is the only game to properly have Sonic the Hedgehog combat. Frontier's combat has lots of room to grow. Again, I feel like most of the attacks are just new finishers and the parry is way too lenient. However, it did not break up my fast-paced gameplay of Sonic running through the island and solving puzzles. It worked well to complement the fast-paced open zones and thus Sonic as a character. Alright, at least three of you might start asking, why should I engage in combat? Well, thanks for pretending to care. Anytime you defeat a Guardian and a few special mooks, Sonic receives a gear. A gear he can use to enter a cyberspace stage through these portals. And cyberspace is the fastest means to acquire keys needed for the Chaos Emeralds. As I said earlier, cyberspace is an important mystery of Starfall Island. Eggman and Sonic's friends are all trapped here, and Sonic was only able to escape because of his speed. And due to that initial escape, Sonic's able to go in and out of cyberspace through portals. Now when we talk to Sonic's friends in the open zones, they explain that they see some of their deepest fears and past memories meshed together, which in gameplay means reuse of both stage aesthetics and level layouts from the past. And I'll get this out of the way first. On paper, this sounded like a nightmare, mainly because of the aesthetics they chose. It's only Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Sky Sanctuary, and a nondescript city level reminiscent of City Escape. All four themes appearing in Generations, the former two reappearing in both Forces and Mania, and Green Hill equivalents are found in Sonic 4, Lost World, every mobile phone game. Seems like everyone has it in their fan game, just a general oversaturation. Pre-release and even when I put it to paper, I didn't like this. It's lame and an obvious way to reuse assets. And I'm not against asset reuse, it happens. Many games come out way faster because of asset reuse like Ratchet and Clank, Kingdom Hearts, and even looking at Sega, we've got that motherfucking Kamodocho.zip, they'll slide in to start every new Yakuza. I really don't care if assets are reused, but I have an issue with reusing Green Hill and Chemical Plant specifically and to the extent they did. The oversaturation makes me not at all excited to see it. I think it would have been cooler if they had reused aesthetics from the open zones for the cyberspace levels, or hell, have more than just four aesthetics. If you're going to reuse, there's tons of levels from forces that have beautiful art with poor level design. I would have liked to see a fully realized version of Metropolis, Mystic Jungle, or even the Green Hill that's looking 
a lot like Sand Hill. Like, it doesn't matter which one you base it on. These are glorified special stages to earn Chaos Emeralds with numbers like it's a Mario game. So now I'm just referring to it as Sky Rail and Frontiers or that original stage with all the fans. Individual levels don't have a clear sense of identity like Rooftop Run to Savannah Citadel. Even if the context of the story and its themes make these fit the reuse, it's lame. I felt that Sonic's had a problem with set pieces getting less and less recognizable since Unleashed, and Cyberspace doesn't help. I initially thought this would be an instant killer for Cyberspace, yet it's not. Negatives away, I fucking enjoyed myself. First, I know I just shat on the lack of set pieces and whatnot, but as a longtime Sonic fan, I enjoyed trying to guess what stage a level is based on. I even made it a little internal contest to see how quickly I could point out where the stage is from since I had replayed most Sonic games in the two weeks prior to Frontiers. Sure, new players aren't gonna get that same feeling, but I'm not here to speak for them, so I don't know why I have to care about that shit. The biggest idea you gotta throw out when you start cyberspace is that you're not playing a boost game. Sonic controls the same as outside cyberspace with the Psy loop and combat mechanic removed. His speed, acceleration, and all the customizable attributes are also set to neutral, likely so you can share and compare times with friends on an even playing field. So what this entails is no boosting through enemies, precise control, slower top speed, and no drifting besides a level based on Savannah Citadel Act 2. Here they reintroduced a horrible feeling drift for the single act, and most people agree it's the worst one in the game. So I guess it's accurate to the one in Unleashed. Cyberspace physics, more than the open zone, feel like the exact midway point between Adventure 2 and Boost, and the stages help to show that off. At least 21 of these levels are based on Sonic and Shadow stages from Adventure 2, Day stages from Unleashed, and both acts from Generations with the 2D and 3D segments of Boost Sonic separated from the latter two. There's a few debated ones including 4-3 which has these dongle bits like Tropical Jungle in 06, but other than that I can't see any resemblance. As a companion piece to the original stages, I enjoyed them. I've run through Sky Sanctuary Act 2, Sky Rail, Savannah Citadel, and others so many times that it gives a fun change of pace for me. It's an interesting companion to the original stages. You get to replay old levels with a totally different skill set, which makes me interested to see what's possible. I feel especially strongly on that with SA2 and Generation, since the two are readily available on Steam for super cheap. No reason to compare if I can have both. Although I can't say the same for Unleashed, like, come on Sega. I don't even like Unleashed as a whole, but even I know that right now is the perfect time to re-release it at a stable 60fps, and maybe someone will mod out the fucking warehouse fight there. <laughs> Each stage is pretty close to what it's based on, just with parts cut out, and maybe swap a platform with a rail. Shortcuts in Sky Rail still work, Rooftop Run Act 2 still causes me to bite my lip when going for S ranks, and they often place red rings close to their original position. However, since they cut the stages short of their original, red rings are handed to you easier than before. Which brings me to the challenges in each level. Cyberspace is the fastest means of obtaining the keys needed for Chaos Emeralds, with the potential to earn four per stage. One each for completing the stage, receiving an S rank purely based on time, finding all red rings, and finishing the stage with a set amount of normal rings. All goals you can theoretically make in a first run through a level, and likely achieve on the second since red rings carry over. I'm not a fan of how easy they are, but I can somewhat forgive it. You gotta keep in mind with Cyberspace, it has two primary goals. Give the player a familiar yet fresh experience in a game that changes the Sonic formula, and complement the open zone. We're not going through the open zone purely to hit a Cyberspace stage, we are using a Cyberspace level to further our progression in the open zone. It's like a reverse of Sonic Adventure 1's formula. Rewarding the player with enough keys to continue their adventure without unneeded roadblocks keeps up the pace of Sonic. Look, if you've put any time into past Sonic games, you're gonna get every achievement with only a couple of hassles. Due to Frontier's mechanics put on stages built for differently designed mechanics, you can cheese your way past most stages far faster than the developers intended. And that is a two-sided thing. I had fun seeing how I could break the level, but a few unleashed and generation stages have corridor designs that you no longer blaze through in 3D, while ones based on classic Sonic and Generations can have some awkward moments with Frontier's physics. I mean, I had forces flashbacks at chemical plants. But anyway, Frontier's mechanics changes your primary goal. Now, you want to ignore as many objects as possible. Like I said earlier, Frontier slows you down at any spring, homing attack, and what have you. So while most shortcuts and extra routes from the old stages are still present, this isn't always the fastest way to win. It gets even more 
interesting with the homing attack. All three of the game's frontiers pulled from through homing attack chains everywhere before it raised your score and didn't take up much time. Now that homing attacks take longer and S ranks come purely from time, the new goal is to avoid landing a homing attack whenever possible. It's a new challenge letting me look at these old stages in a way I hadn't before. And despite my weird relationship that I'll save for another day, the ones from Unleashed are ironically some of my favorites. For example, Chunan Act 3 has a rhythm I find fun to maintain. Due to enemy placement and boost limitations, your best means to keep forward momentum is to air boost and then bounce on as few platforms as possible. Cyberspace necessitates a minimalist approach to win quickly, which you can take even further with the fucking homing cancel. This is probably the jankiest part of Sonic's control, and I better not see anyone patch this out. If you air boost out of a homing attack, Sonic continues the forward momentum built by the homing attack and fucking flies. This one likely unintended strategy has made speedrunning single stages even more fun than before, and I fucking love seeing people's clips online of it. People are getting times I thought impossible, and it just gets me to pick the game back up to try. Made even easier since you can select whichever one you want after you beat the game. They really got a DLC and a leaderboard because I want to compare with my friends even easier. Anyway, while I've focused on the remade levels, the brand new ones are some of the best designed in a while. Of the nine I currently consider original, two are two-dimensional, while seven are 3D and found in the final island. Obviously, I don't know the order each stage was designed, but these final seven feel like the stage designers took what they noticed in old levels and made real bangers out of the new ones. We've got tons of alternate routes, smaller platforms instead of the wider areas we've seen in the boost formula, and even the camera angles felt more dynamic than the recreated stages. Never as dynamic as Unleashed or SA2, but more than most of colors. Honestly, these new ones are some of the closest a level has felt to SA2 since 06. I'm hoping that next time around, the 3D stages can feel like these, and maybe the 2D ones can vibe like the Act 2 and 3 missions from Unleashed or Acts 4 through 6 in colors. Since a majority of cyberspace stages are in the minute and a half range, Frontiers made me reevaluate their gimmicky, short burst nature. I think they fit best for bite sized filler stages, and I think it'd work well going forward. My biggest takeaway from the open zone format was how coherently they made everything feel. Combat, puzzles, exploration, arcade stages, it all kept the Sonic rhythm for me. The open zone has what I'd find in a traditional Sonic zone, but I'm given the choice of what act I go to next and can even slip into a separate act whenever. I won't even always go to that separate act on purpose. It's clearly segmented aspects of a game that are meshed together quite well. Sonic's fast paced nature is maintained at all times. I didn't have the dread of starting a town mission in 06, or even to look at a good game, the switch in speed I feel when entering the hub worlds in SI1. I see a new enemy on my way to a plot marker, and I'd suddenly want to take it out. When I'm trying to get a memory token there, I'll do a funny boost into another one I shouldn't be able to get. It felt good to climb those large towers, look down, and marvel at the next spot I'd be going if the draw distance wasn't such shit. Yeah, in terms of frame rate and lighting effects, this is the Sonic game that probably looks the best, but draw distance is just garbage. And yeah, I know someone's gonna say I eat up mediocrity or some shit for this next one, but pop-in doesn't bother me. Like, yeah, I look at it and I can say this is not good, but so can everyone else with working eyes. I never personally felt removed from the experience, nor did it alter my enjoyment. Actually, the first few times it happened, my mind immediately filled in the gaps by assuming it was a thematic reason, even though I absolutely knew that wasn't the case. It filled in an idea that it's architecture glitching in from cyberspace, which makes sense in the story. 800%, that's not what's going on, just my brain working kinda funny. A more likely reason is that the draw distance was built around the Switch's architecture, and that led to every version having the issue. Going off my dumb brain filling in the gaps, I think they should have added some kind of cyberspace glitch effect to the architecture. I know that's a PS1 era Silent Hill fog type of thing, but I checked with a professional game dev friend, and he said that's realistically not too intensive. And despite the Sega hire this man fears I had pre-release, I grew to like the way Sonic looked juxtaposed to his environment. Looked jank originally, yeah, but his cartoony look gives him a four and feeling up against Starfall. Fitting, since he's not welcomed here. Music though, oof, that's a different story. Frontiers is easily in my S tier for Sonic soundtracks, and that's saying a lot. One of its benefits is that this is the largest soundtrack in the series at six CDs. Otani said he started work on it four years ago, and damn does it show. Almost everything's got a song to accompany it. For example, every Guardian has their own stressful techno rhythm incorporating separate instruments to match the foe. Now the island themes, while they don't fit with other Sonic music, 
I've gotta just respect them. They have slow, ambient melodies more reminiscent of, say, Crystal Chronicles or Made in Abyss, yet they still knock it out of the park. First of all, each track is beautiful in its own right, but it goes even one step beyond that because the tracks actually change with every Chaos Emerald you earn. You'll initially have next to nothing play, a few piano notes, occasional drums, a subtle sound to make you feel lost in a new island. And with every bit of progress, your direction gets clearer, your map is filling out, and you hear the sounds calling out to you. Absolute next level stuff. Well, we get to the next level in 32X world with the cyberspace music. Yeah, cyberspace wasn't memorable by aesthetics, but the music, holy shit, this is what sets them apart. Not a single track is repeated in the 30 levels, and they're all bangers. It's pure EDM that touches upon so many subgenres in it. Psytrance, house, light dubstep, anything to give a glitchy out of this world idea. And actually, my top set were usually the calmer ones like Digital Caves or Trap such as Go Slap that used a heavy bass. Frontier's soundtrack does not miss, so I'm happy to put it in my top tier with SA2 and Japanese CD. So I praised everything else, but I guess if there's one thing you can say breaks the pace, it's the minigames. Some of them are good pace breaking in my opinion, while others just break the pace. I guess the only one that super annoyed me was this crane game, but it only lasts like two minutes at most. Everything else was kind of just funny to me. Sonic's friends trigger them at story progression points, and I like that they either cater to Sonic's character or reference a past game. Knuckles having you quickly save Coco's before they're crushed, or Amy telling Sonic to mow the lawn with a side loop fits what he has. And we got pinball too. Sonic's always gotta have pinball. We also got this diving segment that reminds me of the special stages in Chaotix, and of course, fishing with Big. Yeah, Big the Cat is here. Don't question it. And he'll let you fish as long as you can pay him some purple stuff. I like this. I feel like it's a do-over to fishing in SA1. You can also buy any of the collectibles here, like the Cocos, Emerald Keys, and so on. Everything outside besides Chaos Emeralds can be obtained here, and everything in here can be obtained outside besides some Eggman logs that are kind of similar to Ansem's report. As long as you have the patience and purple stuff, you can grind it out to skip anything you want. Getting purple coins is a bit of a gamble though. They're not completely littered across the stage like everything else, so your main means of getting them is through this sub-event called Starfall. A little meteor shower starts up and you have a slot machine that takes meteors as currency while giving out purple coins. The slot machine can get in the way and it sounds kind of stupid when I say it out loud, but in the context of the game... Oh wait, that one's not explained. Well, everything else is, so here comes the spoiler section. As I very briefly mentioned, this is the first Sonic video game written by longtime comic writer Ian Flynn. He's written these characters since 2006 with Archie, so he's had his experience with them. I think I've mentioned this at least twice in past videos, I'm a pretty big comic nerd when it comes to the likes of Superman, Cosmic Marvel, and whatever else I suddenly feel interested in collecting. Sonic wasn't quite one of those. By the time I was getting into Sonic, we already had a sizable enough cast to make TV shows like Sonic X, and Archie was overblown with its own cast of characters I didn't really care about. I tried it a few times when I was little and it just didn't really click. I know many claim it confusing and I've read enough comics to know it probably won't be if I start from issue 1 and work my way up, but anytime I've tried that I lose interest. Antoine de Baguette and 2 Bunny don't interest me like Shadow and Blaze. However, I did give the comics more chances during Ian Flynn's tenure. I read some early arcs of Sonic Universe, first few issues of Archie Reboot, stepped in and out a few more times, and finally started caring once IDW had a total reboot. I wrote in my script that I read up through the Metal Virus arc, but after finishing writing, I got really hyped and read the rest of it, which can probably tell you how much I've been enjoying it. It's exactly what I've wanted from a multimedia Sonic project, a true extension of the game's universe. Through all the times I've read Ian's work, I've come to recognize him as a really good fixer. Call him Mr. Tinker, if you will. Including Frontiers, he's had to course correct Sonic five times now. Once after he became the lead writer at Archie, again after Archie rebooted, then Sega had him write the Forces prologue comic, which mostly spends time filling the plot holes in Forces, the IDW comics, which itself spends the first saga course-correcting events after Forces, and now with Sonic Frontiers. Ian's got an encyclopedic knowledge of Sonic lore, and that lends itself well to making past events feel connected and connecting his new ideas into it. The only Sega characters to show up in Imposter Syndrome is Eggman and Metal Sonic, and it still fits into the Sonic universe seamlessly, probably because the characters within it are actually introduced instead of dumped on you 
feel like an Archie. You can argue Ian has an over-reliance on references to past events in all his works, be that story or simple line reads, but I think that's a plus in most instances. Dr. Starline looking to the Zeddy for his plan during the Metal Virus not only further integrates Starline into the world of Sonic, it improves upon the Zeddy after their underuse in Lost World. And y'all can probably tell from my description of Ian Flynn, he and the director, Morio Kishimoto, use Frontiers to course correct the story of Sonic. Reincorporate lore, character relationships, and attributes people loved and even hated back into Sonic for a seemingly simple adventure after Unleashed began the loose canon we followed for nearly half of Sonic's lifespan, using those past events to look toward the future. In fact, Sonic's goal seems as simple as Sonic 2 Master System for a majority of Frontiers, save Sonic's friends as well as some funny creatures along the way. Everything else like finding the Emeralds, fighting the Titans, and figuring out Starfall's mysteries becomes secondary to him after Tails and Amy are trapped in cyberspace. Even every time he saves them, he takes up part of a cyberspace virus, one we can visually see messing with him during Chaos and Rhea Island. It actually doesn't do much and comes off as a cheap version of the Metal Virus, but it helps us see how much Sonic loves his friends. Islands 1 through 3 follow a simple formula. Sonic discovers Island, Mysterious Voice tells him things, release Amy, Knuckles, or Tails from their cyberspace pods, Sage shows up with a Titan to beat the shit out of him, talk to Sage and Sonic's holographic friends, get the Chaos Emeralds, learn secrets about the ancient civilization, beat the Titan. I used a lot of words there, but it's a simple formula. There's no presidents, egg fleets, or resistance here. Instead, we're focused on character interactions between Sonic, his friends, and Sage. Frontier's greatest strength comes from the relationship-focused conversations between Sonic and his friends. It took me for surprise, since Sonic typically has the moment-to-moment -moment plotline such as SA2 and Forces, or a Saturday morning cartoon one like Generations, Colors, and I'd even argue Unleashed. And as much as I love the cheesy dialogue and one-off moments in the pre-Unleashed era, it never gave characters time to breathe. One moment led to the next, which led to the next, which led to the greater action, and then the game's usually done. Without double-checking anything, the only moments I can think of where heroes rest easy were during endings like Sonic Heroes or Black Knight. Moments when everyone rests. While well, Frontiers sets time for everyone, bringing out the heart and humanity of our small six cast members. I'm not arguing that Sonic never had a good story until now, or that he should always go slower. Actually, SA2 is still my favorite, and I'd argue the fast-paced moment-to-moment structure works better for Sonic's character. But when every entry takes that approach, or a borderline non-existent one, you need one game to slow down. Kishimoto, Sonic Team, and Ian Flynn are absolutely using Frontier's non-linear structure, slower pace, and small cast to reincorporate a majority of past Sonic games and comics into canon, while laser-focusing on Tails, Amy, and Knuckles' dormant SA2 say one traits to prepare us for future stories. Amy has a desire to nurture the weak without Sonic's help like with Birdie, Knuckles is finally questioning the point in his solitude and duty to guard the Master Emerald after seeing it to call in chaos, while Tails is worried about growing up and burdening Sonic. And I feel what's most interesting about Tails and Amy's stories is actually how Ian has been implementing those into the IDW comics. Amy leads the resistance in the rebuilding era post forces, while Tails is scared to follow Sonic into his tougher dangers. And unlike in SA1 and even IDW, Sonic gets real time to talk to his friends about their anxieties. Everyone gets time to tell Sonic what they mean to him. Amy wishes she could help people at the same speed as Sonic, Knuckles admires his carefree life, and Tails wants to personally help Sonic as gratitude for basically raising him. And Sonic actually responds like a friend would, like a rival would, how your brother would talk to you. We see a different side of Sonic with his friends because he loves and cares about them. Sonic is talking to Amy like a friend, not a love-starved fangirl. It makes me want to actually see these two characters grow rather than Sonic run away because of Whoa, girls are icky! And I'll be honest, I had long forgotten what Sonic and Knuckles' rivalry actually looked like. Sonic and Knuckles' differences had their first moment to shine here since, debatably, SA1. I love the snarky attitude they have towards each other. It gives them mutual respect, more weight, more yaoi fuel. And my favorite just little minor thing is the respect he shows for Tails beyond just being his little buddy. Anytime he, Knuckles, and Amy are confused, they imply that Tails will fix everything. This technology doesn't make sense to them, but Tails is the smart guy, he can fix everything for them. Even though the anxieties Tails is feeling about himself, every
everyone else sees his accomplishments. These four are friends with each other, not individuals that save the world together and then return to the status quo afterwards. Now, the other part of this that everyone's pointed out, the references. Our main cast references past events without hesitation. Sonic and Knuckles talk about Sonic 3, Super Sonic even flinching when Knuckles is about to punch him, Tails compares the power of Starfall's tech to Dark Gaia, even reviled plot elements like Black Doom get a reference. There's no more dancing around the subject about their past. Frontiers is not the first Sonic game, so it's time to stop acting like nothing else has happened. Almost all the main series games are playable on Steam or easy to emulate, so why bother ignoring things? And I appreciate that so much in Frontiers. We've already got the movie and game synergy with Sonic adding lightning to his boost and even minor references to Tangle and Sticks to make them canon in the main universe now, so why can't we mention games? I always hear people make arguments against this type of stuff like, this only appeals to longtime fans, but no one ever talks about how it can get people into old entries. And I'll admit, I'm even guilty of this in my Kingdom Hearts retrospective. I had a few comments telling me they enjoyed starting with 358 and going back to line the pieces up. What you gotta remember here, Sonic is aimed at kids, and from working with kids in the past, I can tell you they'll have an encyclopedic knowledge of a fictional universe far better than most adult fans. The quick references will get them interested in trying the games that I, and judging by my viewer demographic, most of you grew up with. Kishimoto, Sonic Team, and Flynn have a vision for where they want these characters to go, and it relies quite heavily on what they've done in the past. Frontiers is fostering new Sonic fans for the future by letting them see why people love Sonic in the past, and I don't think there's a better example for this than the new character Sage. Early into the journey, Sage shows herself to Sonic with one of the bosses known as the Titans. As she herself was the program that Dr. Eggman implanted onto Starfall's tech, she knows the island's mysteries, letting her alter the Titans' emotions so that they'll attack Sonic in her attempt to remove him from Starfall. After that, she shows up intermittently to complain at Sonic that all the action he takes are in vain, explaining nothing. She's the new rival type character similar to Shadow, Metal Sonic, or Infinite. Though unlike the past rivals that fit a similar archetype, Sage isn't a fighter. She's a calculating AI that only knows what's in her program. And since she was made by Dr. Eggman, she only knows about Sonic from his perspective, a blue rodent that gets in his way. Her distaste for Sonic comes from a place of ignorance. Sage represents someone who isn't a Sonic fan, an individual that only knows about Sonic from what she's told, often something negative. As the story goes on, we see her grow more interest in Sonic. Sage wants to know what makes Sonic a friend to everyone, why Knuckles will risk his life for him, why Tails wants to fly higher than him, why we keep buying his games when they disappoint more often than not. And even Sonic catches on to that. He stops seeing her as an annoying brat and starts messing with her curiosity. Sonic doesn't see Sage as a challenge like he did Metal or Shadow. He treats Sage like the niece who keeps asking too many questions. Sonic got confused and sick of her stand-your-ground laws attitude in the first part, and by the second half he patronizes her questions. Sonic has the upper hand over Sage not due to power, but his friendship and compassion, something Sage wishes she could have. Sentiments she then flings and questions towards Dr. Eggman. Eggman created Sage, and the human-like AI in Sage makes her see the Doctor as her father, while Eggman, trapped and alone within cyberspace, starts to see Sage as his daughter. It's honestly some of the cutest shit in a Sonic game. Even one scene Eggman is bashing on Orbot and Cubot just for her to respond. They are your creations, like me. That would make them like my brothers. Hmm. Sage likes the idea of living together with Eggman and his creations after Frontiers. All she actually wants is a happy family. It brings Sage at odds with their own ideas once she understands Sonic, and pleads with Eggman to team up with them like they did when they were on the arc or against Neo Metal Sonic. Oh wait, I know those games! What makes it work even more is Eggman's shared desire for a family and companionship. A loose piece of his history that Adventure 2 planted the seeds to go into, but never did because... We all did it together! I get the impression from Frontiers and IDW that they're about to tap into a humane and nuanced version of Eggman that we have never seen yet. One beyond the batshit evil seen in Archie, or the pure comedic funny guy since Unleashed. Eggman isn't happy in his solitude. He wants someone to validate him and care for him, but not just praise him like Starline. The extra step in forces that fucking make this is the Egg Memos, voice logs he recorded during his time in cyberspace. It starts mainly with Eggman questioning the tech of Starfall, comparing it to past 
past civilizations like the Babylonians and Echidnas, and even figuring out that the ancient civilization that used to live here, known as the Ancients, evolved into the Chow, and are thus related to chaos. Around midway in, Eggman talks more about Sage. The efficient numbers she crunches for him, how she pesters Sonic, jokes she tells him, and he gets more excited the further he goes. It's honestly Mike Pollock's best performance as Eggman for me, which was already a good record. The biggest heartstring was when he compares Sage to Maria, explaining outright that all of his family cared more about Maria than him even after her passing, clarifying Eggman's desire for family and demystifying his relationship to Maria and Gerald. Even if there's so few cutscenes between the two characters, the way they talk about each other helps me to fill the gaps in their relationship to the point where it's one of my favorites in the series. Although, speaking of the lack of actual cutscenes, there is one part where Sage has an emotional moment that got me tearing up at first, and then it cuts to a flashback of all her scenes with Eggman that happened to be in the same spot. I went from tears to bewilderment pretty quick on that one. <laughs> Now, one of my favorite parts of Sage compared to other rivals is that she doesn't have a boss fight. She herself only even attacks Sonic once, and Sonic knows that their rivalry isn't because of strength. It makes it so her loss isn't because Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles beat the shit out of her and shout, WE'RE SONIC HEROES! Her loss comes from seeing Sonic's attitude, his will to go on, his love for his friends. That passion that's gotten people into Sonic and will get more into it after here. Anyway, that's enough about the sappy shit. Let's talk about the boss fights. Sonic Frontiers, bar none, has the greatest boss fights in the series. I mean, literally, the only competition is Final Hazard, and that's just for its iconicity. So, you've gotten six of the Chaos Emeralds on the island, find the last mandatory cutscene with your friend, they show you a gate, and there it fucking is. The big titan of the island powered by the seventh Chaos Emerald. And after that short bit I mentioned earlier where the titan absolutely fucks over Sonic, getting face to face feels tight as fuck. So you spend the first half of the fight running up to his Emerald Shrine, and here it comes, Super Sonic. Yeah, every island boss fight is done as Super Sonic. Not only that, for the first time, Super Sonic controls similarly to the main gameplay. It's the exact same combat system, but supercharged with flight. Sonic goes from one dinky kick to hundreds of shadow clones, swirling the boss high up into the sky, dodging rockets, grabbing swords, pushing back key blasts. This is raw, unadulterated Dragon Ball Z shit, and I fucking live for it. If you're dressing Sonic up like a goddamn Super Saiyan, it was time to actually do it. I don't even give a shit that some of it's a little janky. It is hype in incarnate. We fight an Ava, a Panzer Dragoon looking ass wyvern, mechanist from the game I haven't played, and a Gundam. First time I reach boss one, it's 3 a.m. Buddy's watching me play. One of them was being a hater most of the way, and once I went supersonic, he shut the fuck up for the rest of the run. Anytime I reached a boss fight, I'd take a break just to make sure the squad is on call and we'd get hype at every moment. Sonic's fighting the night, sword flies out of his hand, whole call is just waiting for the moment when Sonic picks up that fucking sword and slashes the Titan like he's Future Trunks. And by fucking god. The music. Frontiers had all the great music I mentioned from before, and the vocal tracks in the bosses are raw. This ain't just normal Dragon Ball anymore, it's the US dub of Cooler's Revenge. New metal, hard rock, blaring. Even after beating the whole game, not a single moment will top when Sonic went super and undefeatable started. That was the burning cherry on top of this super Sonic fight. You would not believe how long I've been yearning for this. First moment after I beat forces, I made a stupid fucking low effort meme and sent this to my friend. I wanted just any super Sonic boss fight, and Frontiers came out with the three best.
I've been waiting to finally delve into the Chaos Emeralds in relation to Starfall Islands for dramatic effect since it was the main thing I thought about before release. While about half the character conversations relate to each other, the other half questions what the island is, who made it, yada yada yada. Everyone is piecing together hints slowly, with only the tiny Coco creatures giving them proof of life on the island. Those Cocos are the real key. Sonic's friends all have one in each island they want to help, and as you do, new Mexico-toned flashbacks show you a glimpse of how the ancients lived on the island. Before Rhea, we learned that the ancients were lanky, water-based beings like Chaos living in fear of something, advancing Starfall Island so it could use the power of the Chaos Emeralds to ward off the threat they feared, using giant lasers and their architecture for heavy weaponry while the Guardians and regular robots safeguard the floor. Cyberspace was created to house the data, memories, and maybe even the souls of the ancients, and when combined with the memories of Sonic, his friends, Eggman, data from every database on Earth, and maybe knowledge stored in the Emeralds, it created the weird mess of stages Sonic hooped through. And the reason that the Cocos showed these flashbacks is because they're actually the lucky charms the ancients wore that gained sentience and tapped into cyberspace to see the ancients' memory. And Rhea clarifies the rest of the mysteries. As I said before, it's 800% a story-focused area. So despite Sage's warning, Sonic's freed his friends and defeated the Titans, but there's still holograms and towers housing more flashbacks appear before him. As it turns out, shit tons of years ago, they used the power of the Chaos Emeralds to leave their home planet before it blew up. On their hunt for a new world, the Master Emerald, which is native to Earth, brought the Seven Chaos to it. Following that, the Ancients built the Titans as mechas to pilot so they can stop the evil that destroyed their world from blowing up Earth. It then ends with the Ancients sealing the evil force within one of the mechas, which will be the final boss of Aranos. Meaning, yeah, the Chaos Emeralds are from space. We still don't know how they're made, what they did on that planet, or have any kind of quantifiable data for their power, which I imagine only the Master Emerald can know at this point. Honestly, of every alien, the Ancients are the ones that fit the bill for Alien and Sonic the most, besides the Wisps. Babylonians never screamed Alien, and I'm not even getting into the Black Arms today. There might be a slight lore to discrepancy with Dark Guy and the temples, but I always got the impression that Light and Dark Guy's fights changed with the millennia, so maybe it didn't involve the Emeralds the first time. Anyway, the fourth Titan housing Unmatched Evil is released. The Unmatched Evil is actually the voice that's been telling Sonic stuff all journey. Sonic gets cured of his cyber virus by the power of friendship. Zade uses Puppy Dog Eyes to get Eggman to team up with Sonic, and now it's time for the final island. It's nothing I haven't really already talked about. I skipped talking about it earlier because it's pretty similar to Kronos, but with a heavier combat focus. I'll add that it is pretty cute that Sage actually changes her color scheme from the black and red to a white and blue now that she's happier. So, the final boss is when Sonic Frontiers takes a large nosedive. The boss, Supreme, if I'm going to compare to only the final bosses in Sonic, he'd likely still make top 5, but after the high standard set by the other three titans, it's a disappointment that brings it down a lot. The fight against Supreme is pathetically easy. There's no climb on top of him, we can stay in mostly the same spot, his attacks are easier to dodge than the Ava, and he only uses his giant ass sniper rifle for a quick time event. He gets this bullet hell segment that reminds me a bit of the Bio Lizard, but besides that, it's nothing we didn't have with the first boss. Like, there's some unique stuff to him. He's got the gun, kind of this shield looking thing on his back, he grows wings, and they just don't do anything with it. There's a reason I didn't use much footage of him when talking about the other three, and it's not because of spoilers. Those are solid S tier bosses, and this would probably be like a B in a different game, but I gotta put it like in D. And the following phase, while while I like it, doesn't make up for Supreme's faults. For the narrative, as the evil force stopped by the Ancients was only sealed within Supreme, she escaped her Gundam shell to reform in space. So Supersonic goes to space to fight who's known as the End with Sage as she's piloting Supreme. But not before another quick tear at my heart as Eggman worrisomely looks towards his new daughter, wondering if he'll ever see her again. A grand setup for one of the greatest bosses in Sonic history, and it's Ikaruga. Don't get me wrong, I love Ikaruga, it's just a somewhat odd choice. So odd that many wondered if this was even intentional, and Kishimoto has at this point confirmed that yes, it was. See, it doesn't come completely out of nowhere. We had three or four short hacking puzzles in the Ikaruga style, so they did have the wise idea to prepare us for it. Some people thought since they ran out of time they just took that minigame and put it on the final boss, but 
let's be real, you don't add an entire Ikaruga for a combined three minutes of playtime. In that same confirmation by Kishimoto, he did admit that the final act was compromised. Everyone could tell, so I'm mainly just glad that Kishimoto was upfront about it instead of leaving it to speculation, especially because it lets me view this final boss as what they intended. The somber atmosphere, Sonic and Sage's team up, the beautiful music, everything about it became better to me in hindsight. It wasn't a grand bombastic finale, but a slow one to reflect on Sonic's journey. There's still a sour taste in my mouth about the finale, but the more I think about it, it's because of Supreme rather than the end. If Ikaruga came after another S-tier Titan battle, I think most people would be more forgiving. And who knows? Maybe Sonic himself got that fight. Kishimoto added that everyone views the end differently, so he and Sage weren't fighting a moon. Maybe Sonic saw Eggman, Mephilus, or his fear of failure to his friends. This wasn't the final boss I wanted, but now I'm seeing it's what Frontiers needed to begin our new era of Sonic. In the end, Sonic wins and returns to his friends, while Eggman sits alone after Sage's sacrifice. Yet again, Sonic gets all the glory and admiration, with Eggman losing. But for the first time, he's felt real loss. The loss of his child. Driven further with Dear Father, the saddest goddamn Sonic song in the credits. It's sung from Sage's perspective, and it fucking tore me up. And I should add, every vocal track in Frontiers was phenomenal in telling Sonic's story. The three during the Titan bosses reflect on Sonic's past, Vandalize, which plays in the normal ending credits, feels relevant to Sonic's journey in Frontiers, while One Way Dream, the hard mode credits theme, relates to Sonic and Sonic Team's future. It conveys how Sonic Team wants to reach higher after making something they're proud of, getting back up after so many failures. It's also one of Nate Wants to Battle's final songs before moving away from license-based music, and I get the feeling that he may have felt the same making the song. And that look towards the future gets compounded with the mid and post credit scenes. First we see Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Sonic fly off on the tornado. As the former three imply, they're gonna live their lives to the fullest. Amy is gonna spend time with her friends and help the weak, Tails plans to get stronger so he can make Sonic proud, and Knuckles might even adventure off his island a little bit. This scene gives me hope that we're finally leaving what I'd call the solo Sonic era that began in Unleashed. And guess fucking what the DLC announced this week already confirmed new playable characters. Yeah, I wrote a bit here about what DLC I wanted, and Sega announced seemingly the exact stuff I wrote. They're adding new challenge modes, seemingly a boss rush, new challenges in the open zone, and new playable characters with their own new story. Seemingly to include Tails, Knuckles, and Amy, but we can't be too sure yet. I'm keeping my hype down because it'll probably be the end of next year, but I'm excited! First time we've gotten to play these three in 3D since 06, and hopefully their first fun appearance without a team or mech since Adventure 1 for Tails and Amy. Getting them added now makes a lot of sense to me. I originally wrote how putting these three in an open zone is likely easier than throwing them in a boost level without breaking it, and I guess Sonic Team thought the same. The short mid credit scene and now the free DLC announcement has given me hope for what's next that I haven't felt since finishing Heroes as a little kid. I loved Frontiers, but it still has room for improvement, and I'm glad Sonic Team has acknowledged it. It makes me feel like not only are the cast trying to grow up with the ending, but so is Sonic Team. They have trust and faith in what they made, and I can see that. That passion helps me to look past the flaws due to how much love for Sonic I can feel here. But still, Sonic Team obviously MacGyvered some shit here. It's clear whatever happened to their Island 4 idea screwed up Rhea badly. But in my opinion, they held it together with some fucking good glue and paint. Good enough where I think Aranos and Kronos benefited from their compact designs. Now, for Frontiers 2, I've got about one big problem with every aspect in Frontiers I'd like addressed. First, the obvious one, it needs to not suffer from any cuts like Rhea. Flesh out every piece of land to ensure we have the full experience, which now that they have their formula is probably easier to do. For puzzles, like I said, 
it could certainly use harder iterations of themselves. An expansion on their unique ideas, and it seems like DLC will do that at least partially, so I'm not gonna harp on it too much right now. And for the arcade levels, I'm just hoping for some minor gameplay tweaks. Letting me boost after hitting a spring or having a drift again is pretty much it for gameplay. The level design is the big thing for me. It's gonna need to not be an asset reuse jungle next time. If this is another large adventure, I want to walk into these stages from the open zone and see how it connects to the world like an adventure one. Combat is the biggest spot for improvement. It's my favorite combat in Sonic just for fitting the character, but the combo finishers followed by more finishers and the insultingly easy counter hamper it for me. A few weaker attacks with less oomph so the oomphies oomph harder will go a long way for me. And lastly, the big thing for next time, follow up on Frontier's story with Kishimoto, Flynn, and anyone else on the writing team taking helm. They clearly have a vision for Sonic and his supporting cast, and I want to see that vision in the games. I want to know what Knuckles does, if Tails grows, what Eggman up to. In the final scene of the game, we see him late at night in one of his secret labs, computer reflection on his face, indicating that he's gotten desperate for something since Frontiers ended. Whole adventure, we're getting an implication that Eggman might grow soft in the future. But what if he's actually going crazy? Only time will tell what he's up to. Father? That's my girl. Spirit of the ground I'm a spark that won't go out We can go much higher now Gravity can't hold